Welcome at the UNEA, the UN Environmental Assembly uh, this week. So we are here, most of us, at least in, uh, in, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, a wonderful place. And I'm very glad, uh, first of all, to, uh, to, uh, that we have a citation. There was a tough competition to get a citation at this uh, UN Environmental uh, uh, Assembly. And, uh, and out of 450 uh, proposals, we were selected as one of the 30, uh, so which shows the level of exposure and interest that no uh, seaweed has, which is a, a very good point. And I'd like to congratulate Sophia for that because she did all the heavy uh, lifting work uh, to secure that session and, uh, and that's uh, as part of the Global Seaweed Coalition, of course, but uh, with strong support from the government of Madagascar, government of Indonesia, UNEP, UNTAD, World Bank, UNESCO, Friend of Ocean Action, World Resource Institute, the Natural Conservancy, EDF, and the Climate Champion Team. So that's a, a collective work, that's a teamwork to position seaweed as a, a real solution uh, for the triple uh, uh, planetary crisis, uh, as the greatest and top solution we have, the nature-based solution, a global solution. So we are here, and we are very happy to have you all here. A very important day today because uh, I'd like to mention as well that the host uh, country for the UNOC uh, next year, France, uh, is today announcing uh, through his government the seaweed uh, roadmap for the upcoming years. So after many years of uh, discussion, uh, many months of discussion, uh, it should be in a few hours that uh, there will be a roadmap in France once again, which is a very good signal uh, for the UN Ocean Conference uh, next uh, year in, in Nice, and hopefully the rest of the uh, EU will uh, follow the same trend and, and the rest of the world. So, um, but first of all, I would like to give the floor uh, to some somehow our host here uh, this week in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, uh, Leticia uh, Carvalho, who is the head of uh, Marine and Freshwater Branch at uh, UNEP. So Leticia, the floor is yours if you want to... Uh, Tell us a few words and tell us why seaweed is so important for UNEP. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Vincent. And I'm also a proud member of the Seaweed Coalition <laughs> representing UNEP. Steamweed delegates, distinguished guests, their friends, welcome to the sixth uh, United Nations Environment Assembly. This is a pivotal gathering that underscores our shared commitment to preserve our planet for future generations. As we convene here in the beautiful Nairobi for UNEA 6, it is imperative to reflect on the profound significance of this assembly, particularly amid this, the formidable challenges posed by the triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and, bi nature and biodiversity loss and pollution and waste. UNEA serves as a beacon of hope, a platform where nations come together to forge collective solutions to global environmental challenges. The theme of this UNEA 6 emphasizes how effective, inclusive, and sustainable multilateralism can help to tackle the triple planetary crisis resonates deeply in our concurrent context. Now more than ever, collaboration across the borders, the ocean, seas, and coasts is essential as we confront these inter interconnected threats uh, to our planet's health and well-being. For blue ecosystems, oceanic and fresh water, the triple planetary crisis poses immense challenges which threaten many of the planet's most fragile habitats and the species. However, through the murky uncertainty, we catch sight of exciting possibilities. In the past year, efforts to realize the Kumi Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework commenced and targets explicitly calling for action on the ocean are helping to underscore the interconnectivity of, a water, of the water continuum from summit to sea and the myriad species that rely on healthy marine and freshwater systems. In March of 2023, countries reached a historic agreement to protect marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. After nearly two decades of negotiations, these high seas treaties will govern uh, an area that has never been governed before the high seas. And within this context, a global collaboration and our collective efforts to sustainably manage the natural environment, we catch sight of champion ecosystems, which we look towards to help deliver solutions to the triple planetary crisis. Today, I'm very, very pleased and happy to open this event reflecting of, on the role of the seaweed as a nature-based solution and the possible global scaling up of the seaweed sector in a safe and a sustainable manner. Seaweed cultivation holds immense promise as a solution to several environmental crises. Not only does it mitigate climate change by absorbing carbon dioxide, 
but it also offers a pathway to address biodiversity loss and pollution while providing livelihoods for coastal communities. Eight months ago, in June 23, UNEP unveiled its technical report titled Seaweed Farming, Assessment on the Potential of Sustainable Upscaling for Climate Communities and the Planet. This comprehensive report explores the scientific landscape surrounding seaweed farming, not only offering a meticulous literature review, but also providing a situational analysis, assessing the potential for the sustainable expansion of seaweed farming. In trying to understand how to maximize climate benefits while minimizing environmental and social risks, one of the pivotal conclusions to the report highlights of the report highlights is that fostering global partnerships in collaboration with coastal communities is an indis indispensable strategy for safeguarding our environment while delivering maximum protect. This collaborative approach is key to delivering climate, environment, and social benefits. It is through this collaboration and these partnerships that we can contribute significantly to realizing the full potential of the seaweed sector and the sustainable upscaling of seaweed farming, an endeavor that carries the potential to revolutionize our approach to aquaculture and food production. Beyond partnerships and collaborations, we must prioritize research that deepen our understanding of farmed seaweed ecosystems and their ecological impacts and establish financing mechanisms to facilitate the sustainable growth of the seaweed industry, ensuring that investments align with environmental and social ob objectives. At UNEP, we proudly support the work of the UN Global Compact Global Seaweed Coalition. Sunday is here to, to collaborate with us to express this uh, strengthening of our partnership and we are members of the, uh, the Strategic Advisory Council, Council, as I mentioned, with a lot of pride. Our commitment in UNEP is to advance the work in the seaweed sector and making this by significant investments of time and resources into researching the sustainable upscaling seaweed farming. In this important moment, let us reaffirm our commitment to multilateralism and collectively action. By harnessing transformative power of our collaboration, we can overcome the triple planetary crisis and build a more resilience, resilient, sustainable future for all. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with these friends and colleagues in the UN Global Compact Global Seaweed Coalition for convening this event today. And thank you to everyone for joining online and in person to be part of this critical dialogue uh, and for your shared dedica dedication to a more sustainable prosperous blue planet. Back to you, Vincent. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia, for this. It's a very important message, very strong as well. And we are very uh, proud and happy to see that uh, the UN agencies are really working together on that. And we will have a work from Valérie from the World Bank as well. And I think it's absolutely necessary that uh, we work uh, smoothly together uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very well aligned way. And, uh, and thanks for your kind word on seaweed. And, because we often talk about uh, the example of uh, Zanzibar when it comes to seaweed and, uh, and, 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 and Africa, but there, there are other places and we like, and seaweed revolution is already into motion in many countries. Uh, it's already moving forward. So next, uh, after you, I'd like to introduce uh, um, uh, His Excellencies, uh, Robert Ma Mahatante, the Minister for Fisheries and Blue, Blue Economy of the Republic of Madagascar. Madagascar has already, uh, is already experiencing the seaweed revolution there. They are progressing. There's a huge potential there. There's still a lot to do, but a lot has been already done. So, uh, Your Excellence, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Vincent, for giving me the floor. Um, good afternoon, everyone, once again. And um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is my second time to intervene in such a big event talking about uh, seaweed farming. Well, uh, I have prepared, my team and I have prepared a presentation, but it um, seems like uh, I have um, a technical issue. So just let me just to talk, just because I have everything in mind. Um, it, we started to do a seaweed uh, farming since 1989 in Madagascar. That time we started with um, uh, one species and uh, cotoni, and uh, now we, we are planting two of them. So uh, we have capacity and then cotonia at the same time. And um, um, 
what what is the the current situation now? The current situation now is that um, we have the seaweed farming in southwestern Madagascar around Tuliara, which is my hometown, and we also we want to expand in in northern much in northern in um, Murundava, working with. Um, um, the, 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 the Ocean Farmers uh, Company. So Ocean Farmers Company is the biggest. Ocean Farmers is the one leading the seaweed sector now in Madagascar. It is the biggest. And um, the, um, the approach that they are using is we do what we call um, community farming. So it is the community that farms uh, with the, um, the, the, the technical assistance by uh, ocean farmers uh, team, and uh, and then we also have in in San Mari, which is in northeastern Madagascar, and now we would like to expand too in uh, the northwestern Madagascar. Now the current the current production is nearly around two thousand uh, ton uh, dry seaweed annually, but uh, we would wish to. Uh, and improve it by this year around 2,500 and by 2025 up to 30,000 and by the year uh, 30 to uh, 25,000 dry seaweed. So of course, this is a very big ambitious, but um, seaweed represents a very uh, uh, high revenue for the fishing community regarding the climate change, regarding the decline of the uh, capture of fishery and so on and so forth. So seaweed is representing such a, uh, is playing a very big role in our economy in, in Madagascar and mainly within the fishing community. Uh, we have uh, companies, many companies now are interested to come to Madagascar and then invest in seaweed. But uh, let me tell you about the current, uh, the existing companies. We have the, the ocean farmers, as I was mentioning, we also have Makrosud in southern Madagascar. We also have Nusiboraha seaweed. We have Madalg. We also have uh, um, some other uh, companies working in St. Marie and northeastern Madagascar. So in total, we have about seven, eight companies now that are working. But um, now today, we have also some other application from the South Africa, the South African. The South African investors would like to come to Madagascar and then invest in seaweed farming too. We are in a way of putting in place the uh, um, the um, PSM, the, the 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 MSP, the Maritime uh, uh, the, 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 the the MSP, the Maritime um, Planification, Special Planification, Planification. And uh, once we can get done with that, we will be able to to accept some other applications on how to well coordinate now the production in general. Um, what is the main challenges? Of course, we do encountering a lot of uh, issues um, because of the, the climate change. And why? Just because the wind is now becoming more strong and strong. And since the wind is getting stronger, and then of course the current is also getting stronger. So it cuts the, 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 the seaweed easily. And then we also have some um, very intense cyclone. And then you know when we have intense cyclone, and then of course it cuts also, the, it destroys also the, um, the, the, the seaweed. And then it happens to some other places such as like in northeastern Madagascar, including St. Mary, for example. There we have a, a situation, there is a lack of sun as it is a very rainy, very rainy place. And it happens that um, during one week, two weeks, it is always raining. So for you to dry your seaweed, it is taking time. And uh, which means that uh, you have to invest more in putting some roof and some other stuff for you to be able to dry. So it, it is taking time compared to uh, what is uh, existing in Southwestern Madagascar, like in Tuliara, my hometown, for example. And also in Nusi Bay area, in Subi, uh, Nusi Bay area, in Nusifali, in Diego, that is in north of Madagascar. What we have is that there, there are a lot of initiatives around the seaweed farming, but the problem is there are some people 
I, I don't want to name people, but uh, sometimes I have to say, like the Chinese, for example, that they do not master well yet the techniques. But uh, they would wish to be part of uh, the, the, the seaweed sector in Madagascar. So we uh, authorized them to do some kind of a trial. And uh, most of the time, they encounter some uh, environmental issues as they don't master yet the, um, the, 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 the system. So um, we are trying to do our best to, to coach the, this, the, this, the, the, these people also to, to, to by sharing with them all of the uh, existing techniques by using different techniques from ocean farmers, from uh, Nusiboraha seaweed, and so on and so forth. But um, I think that uh, the biggest challenge that uh, we also encounter is the market. Why the market? Just because in some places, for example, now today, we have about um, almost 700 to 1,000 tons of dry seaweed that are not sold. And why they are not sold? Just because the capacity of uh, the Saint Mary, uh, the, the Saint Mary actors, they cannot absorb all of these um, seaweed farming, uh, seaweed. So that's why we are calling for more investors to come and buy seaweed in, in, in Madagascar. But before we say this, we would wish to promote that the, the we would wish to uh, to um, uh, what to recommend to investors to come to Madagascar, also to include farming so that they farm and then at the same time buy and then export so that the whole cycle is covered. And uh, last thing is, the, uh, is um, uh, of course, the process. We do have problem with the process. And why? Just because so far we are exporting the raw seaweed. But our goal, our perspective is to export um, fin uh, final products so uh, for this, we are seeking for collaboration, for collaboration too, with all of the partners. And thanks to uh, Mr. Vincent that is helping us by uh, trying to identify some other partners that can collaborate, work with the existing uh, partners that we have in Madagascar to be able to process the seaweed in Madagascar. So that is the presentation that uh, I have just prepared. And then if you have some questions or comment or observations, I will come back to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pober. You did very, very well and uh, even better without the presentation. I, we feel the energy uh, flowing from you. Uh, so very good. I have to say, because indeed uh, our coalition, our Global Seaweed Coalition, has, uh, uh, is supporting uh, some of the uh, uh, stakeholders that you have mentioned, notably ocean farmers. And I have to say that not only this uh, seaweed activity in Madagascar brings new sources of revenues to coastal community where fishing resources uh, are declining and it are likely to disappear at some point, uh, but they, they support in a very inclusive way uh, this population, and not only that, in a very ethical and sustainable way. I mean, all the material that you are using is renewable, uh, is uh, biodegradable, most of it, or at least uh, can be reused. Uh, there's a fixed price for the farmers and so forth. So I think I always mention Madagascar as kind of a lab of what could be an ideal uh, some point uh, seaweed uh, farming industry because there's a lot of uh, very good uh, uh, a very good example of what should be done uh, not only to make seaweed a, a solution but a sustainable solution as itself so very good job in Madagascar very, a lot of challenges to overcome and a lot of others to overcome but as you mentioned uh, all together uh, through the coalition uh, we can really deliver a, a step change into that. So uh, I'd like not to hear from a very experienced uh, country in seaweed, um, tropical seaweed as well. This, this country, Indonesia, uh, represents over 50% of the tropical coast of our planet. So uh, needless to say that the potential for uh, this country is huge when it comes to seaweed production. It's already the second biggest producer of seaweed in the world, second to China, uh, and quite far to the uh, ahead of the third one. So uh, I'd like to give the floor to the uh, Ministry of National Development Planning uh, uh, and Natural Resources in Indonesia. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity, distinguished delegations, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor for me to speak at the 6th UN Environmental Assembly. I will highlight the importance of affirmative policy for seaweed program and improving its roles for economic and social activities as well as tackling the triple planetary crisis. As you may know, in 2020, global seaweed production volume 
is more than a half of world aquaculture productions. Around 6 million farmers and their families are depending on these activities. The seaweed cultivation industry itself reached around 13.3 billion US dollar. This showed that seaweed aquaculture has contributed for social and economic aspect. For Indonesia context, seaweed has pivotal role to support livelihood as well as accelerating fisheries productions and export values. Indonesia ranked at the second highest, as you may see, uh, as you may uh, mention, uh, on the seaweed producer with a volume of about more than 50 million tons or more than 30% of the global seaweed production volumes. Uh, in 2015 to 2021, the cultivation of seaweed processing and export trend increased significantly. It indicates the important contribution of seaweed to the ocean economy, fisheries uh, productivities, and the prosperity of coastal communities, both in global as well as a national context. Where technology as a means to improve productivity still has some challenges, seaweed farming has been conducted mainly using traditional techniques. The modern seaweed cultivation program uh, has led the create to create a sustainable management for seaweed aquaculture, improving the ecosystem health and protecting marine pollution, and of course, harnessing the ability for capitalize on the added value of these sources. Many small-scale seaweed farmers who play as a main producer actor with traditional technology practice need to be empowered through appropriate technology and strengthen their capacity, particularly in tackling climate change. We recognize the various role of seaweed in protecting the environment and mitigating climate change, i.e. it is recognized as a bio indicator for ocean health. It is also supporting and regulating functions, includes providing, uh, I mean, improving a water quality and preventing the eutrophications, preventing waterborne disease by acting as biofilter for nutrient and pollutants, as a habitat provider for fish and other organisms, and as part of a food chain, as well as the main producer of oxygen for other organisms. Seaweed also acts as a vital source of carbon sequestration by regulating around 268 teragrams of carbon per year. Moreover, the cultivation of seaweed is considered as an environmental friendly activities as it doesn't require the use of land, doesn't require any fertilizing agents in its cultivation process and only requires a good ocean water quality. So we have established opportunities that seaweed farming can assist in carbon capture through harvest and processing into derivative product. For one example, seaweed serves as a sustainable material sources for biodegradable plastics. The hydrocolloids derived from seaweed have a diverse application as biopolymer in bioplastic synthesis, including alginate, azure, and carganan. The remain challenges, though, seaweed can be used as an alternative sources for plastic with biodegradable properties. We should strive to produce biodegradable plastic product on the industrial scale, promote them to reduce marine debris and microplastic into ocean. As the biggest archipelagic country, we have formulated the country blue economic transformation. As a follow-up, we have released the Indonesian Blue Economic Roadmap 2023-2045, and the, this roadmap encourages the promotion of GDP contributions of the maritime sectors through uplifting both established sectors and emerging sectors. Seaweed aquaculture as an important sector has the potential to be uplifted to enhance sustainable economic growth by fostering innovations as well as promoting research and biotech to emphasize the value-added seaweed industries and its derivative products for economic progression as well as for environmental contribution to reduce carbon emissions. The Blue Economy Roadmap uh, we have fo has focused to develop Indonesia's blue economies as a new source of uh, growth. In a macro level, it will cover securing the ecological balance of, with economy, implementing the sustainable production system, strengthening added value and value chain efficiency, revitalizing the structure of fisheries, business actors, 
building reliable database and informations, and formulating a conducive regulation and policy affirmations. In technical ways, the improvement of policy and regulation of seaweed aquaculture may be achieved through strengthening the marine spatial planning, increasing the availability of high-quality seeds and strain, recognizing the downstream application of seaweed, and enhanced infrastructure and research on seaweed seed and strain. So let us reaffirm our commitment to strengthen our seaweed for economic development as well as environmental contributions through making seaweed as a nature-based solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this intervention and to uh, show that this seaweed revolution is already once again active and it's already there. Uh, does not need land, as you mentioned, does not need fertilizers. You don't even need to water the seaweed. So it's uh, it's all good. Uh, and, and we are talking about a few, uh, indeed, more than 30 million tons a year that are already cultivated. And the rest of the world still has to follow the example of Indonesia, China, and a few others, which is to start farming the ocean uh, to solve uh, the big uh, planetary crisis. So we are talking about hope and optimism here, which is kind of a change. Uh, so for the next uh, speaker, I'd like to leave a, a video because I think it's about two o'clock in the morning in uh, in the US where uh, Rod Fujita is living. Uh, Rod Fujita is the Vice President for Research and Development uh, at uh, EDF, uh, Environmental uh, Defense Fund. And uh, he will uh, say a few words about how seaweed can support addressing climate change crisis. Hi, my name is Rod Fujita. I'm an Associate Vice President for Ocean Research and Development at the Environmental Defense Fund. Now, we all know that there is an urgent need to not only reduce emissions of gases that cause climate change, but we also need to find ways to actively remove those gases from the atmosphere if we are to avoid even more severe climate change impacts. So, can seaweed help? The bottom line is that seaweeds can help address the climate crisis, but several big questions remain. We know that seaweeds sequester carbon, but the scale is currently unknown. We also know that carbon sequestration by seaweed is constrained by a number of factors that we will discuss later. So another big question is, can we increase the capacity of seaweed systems to sequester carbon and reduce emissions of other greenhouse gases? Finally, we know only too well the enormity of the challenge we face. We must remove many gigatons of carbon each year. So can seaweed farming with enhanced climate mitigation be profitable enough to scale? To answer these questions, let's start with the fundamentals. Seaweeds remove carbon from seawater very rapidly. Indeed, they are among the most productive organisms on the planet. But that carbon removal does not immediately remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because it takes time for the carbon in the seawater to equilibrate with the carbon in the atmosphere. Also, it's important to remember that carbon absorption by seaweed is not the same as carbon sequestration. In fact, only a fraction of the carbon absorbed by seaweed is sequestered long enough to have an impact on climate change. Natural seaweed beds live in the ocean and produce nutritious seaweed biomass, exudates, and fragments that many different species consume. Consumption of seaweed carbon by marine food webs converts much of it back into carbon dioxide in surface waters where the carbon can return to the atmosphere. Less of the carbon absorbed by seaweeds in farms is lost to the ocean in this way, but when we convert the seaweed into food or colloids, that carbon is also returned to the atmosphere. There are at least three ways we can increase the climate mitigation benefits of seaweeds, and there may be more. The first is to grow more seaweed in waters that can support good growth and also increase advection of seaweed fragments to depositional basins where the carbon can be sequestered. Second, we could decarbonize seaweed production so that seaweed farms can remove much more carbon than they admit. Third, we can scale the production of seaweed products that could help reduce greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Some recent studies suggest that current greenhouse gas emissions associated with seaweed farming 
could offset carbon sequestration by those farms. So it will be important to figure out how to make the carbon footprint of seaweed farming, processing, and transportation as small as possible. EDF has constructed a seaweed farm in the Philippines using local materials, construction techniques, and harvesting methods, and we're keeping track of the embodied and actual greenhouse gas emissions to see if these methods can result in a lower carbon footprint. More work must be done to find low or zero emission ways to dry and transport seaweed or to process seaweeds into value added products close to farms because a lot of the emissions are from drying and transport. Most of the products made from seaweed today result in the return of the carbon absorbed by the seaweed back to the atmosphere. However, there are several seaweed products in various stages of development and commercialization that prevent this from happening, thereby increasing the climate mitigation benefits of seaweed. Some of these products store the seaweed carbon like concrete and adobe made with seaweed. Other products can replace greenhouse gas intensive products like fossil fuels and plastics. Biostimulants and fertilizers made from seaweed could spare emissions to the extent that they result in increased crop yields and cause farmers to use less commercial fertilizer. And some seaweed products seem capable of suppressing methane emissions from cows, manure, and rice fields, although more research will be necessary to provide firm evidence of efficacy and safety. Carbon sequestration by natural seaweed beds is constrained by their need for shallow water habitat. Currently, seaweed farming only occupies a few thousand square kilometers of ocean area. In theory, it is possible to grow seaweed wherever there is sufficient light, enough nutrients to avoid nutrient competition with phytoplankton, and where sea surface temperatures are likely to remain low enough to support good seaweed growth. Our recent analysis of environmental and economic suitability suggests that the total suitable area for profitable seaweed farming that generates climate benefits may be hundreds of times larger than the current aerial extent of seaweed farming, indicating a strong potential for scaling. EDF is engaged in a strategy to scale seaweed farming and increase its climate mitigation benefits. We're building markets for well-documented seaweed ecosystem services like nutrient removal and the remediation of ocean acidification to increase the profitability and investability of seaweed farming. We are using our demonstration farm to collect the data necessary to quantify carbon sequestration and develop a robust MRV system for the farm. We will evaluate the effects of a biostimulant made from our seaweed on crop yields and greenhouse gas emissions in order to drive a life cycle analysis of net greenhouse gas impact of the seaweed use case. We also hope to catalyze strategic investments and partnerships to remove barriers to scaling seaweed products that have real climate mitigation potential. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very nice uh, statement. And uh, we see that there's a real potential uh, for uh, seaweed as a, as a climate change mitigation. Uh, but, but we need to be driven by science and we need to understand what are the consequences. We need to understand the real limit and what is the impact on, on the environment. So all of this, as everything we are doing uh, with this coalition for the last three years, has to be driven by science. And who uh, is better positioned than Carlos Duarte uh, from King Abdallah, Abdallah, Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, uh, Carlos is one of the most recognized scientists in the world. I think, uh, Carlos, you, uh, you reached the highest number of publications related to the ocean last year uh, and a visionary uh, scientist for the ocean. So, Carlos, uh, the floor is yours. Tell us uh, the perspective from, uh, from science and, and from uh, scientific on this. Uh, thank you, Vincent, for the kind introduction. And also then my, my contribution today will dovetail on the ones before. So that's a very good uh, set of presentations that we heard today. And uh, I would like to uh, add some uh, thoughts on the contribution of seaweed to uh, climate mitigation, but also address the other two elements that are in the title of the event, which is biodiversity and pollution. So uh, basically seaweed are important components of the blue carbon family of ecosystems in the ocean, which are, um, 
uh, habitats dominated by macroscopic uh, photosynthetic organisms, we cannot really call them plants, that uh, do uh, play a role in sequestering carbon uh, by uh, uh, producing far more organic carbon from CO2 that they that is processed in the ecosystem, in the habitat. So that means these are met autotrophic ecosystems and they produce an excess organic carbon that is stored somewhere. Now, when uh, ecosystems do this as, as business as usual, then it, uh, it is neutral relative to uh, climate change because it, it is not either adding or removing excess CO2. So it only becomes relevant when uh, seaweed are uh, either expanding or, uh, or uh, decreasing and declining. Globally, for a wild seaweed, we don't really have a good understanding that they are globally declining or globally increasing. They are declining in some areas, like for instance, the kelp forests are declining, are declining towards the uh, lower latitude uh, end of the range and increasing towards the high latitude end of the range. So the, we don't really know if wild seaweed are increasing or decreasing globally. So whether they are therefore contributing to a reduced uh, emissions or increasing emissions by, by uh, losing a sink. And in any case, a wild seaweed are very difficult to action upon and also very difficult to, if we restore kelp, kelp forest, it's very difficult to then apportion carbon that may, may be found somewhere else to that particular action. So that's why uh, the focus on blue carbon for seaweed is now increasingly targeting uh, seaweed farming because seaweed farming is actionable and seaweed farming does not, uh, it actually it represents new seaweed production in the environment. And the problem today is that we were lacking estimates of what is the carbon sequestration and, uh, uh, of seaweed. As explained by Rod, this is not the same as either the CO2 exchange across the the water surface because the farmers are removing a, a part of the of the yield uh, to process the yield so therefore the co2 exchange in the water surface is not a good proxy of carbon removal by the seaweed farm and it is not the bulk production of the seaweed uh, either so what we have been doing is we've been uh, busy for the last three four years then uh, producing the first empirical estimates of carbon sequestration in soils below seaweed farms. And that was on a project led by Oceans 2050, including uh, about 20 farms globally, uh, contributing 10% of the total uh, seaweed farm area globally. And what we found is a median uh, carbon accumulation rates in sediments below seaweed farms of about two tons of carbon dioxide per uh, hectare per year which is uh, uh, towards the lower bound of carbon sequestration in mangrove and seagrass uh, sediments, but it is nevertheless a significant contribution to uh, sequestered carbon in, in uh, soils below or sediments below the seaweed farm. So that is an element that could possibly be the basis uh, for first a methodology to calculate carbon sequestration by seaweed farms. And second, eventually, uh, compensating the farmers for this service, which is currently not compensated. There are a lot of nuances to convert these estimates into carbon crates, first because there's a high variability between farms, so there will, there will be a need to verify those uh, carbon sequestration rates for individual farms. And uh, second, because the permanence of the carbon is depending on the duration of the, of the concessions of the farms. So um, that means that uh, we could adopt some practices that are being used now in agriculture, which is to use probabilistic estimates to kind of uh, adjust the permanence requirement of carbon in, in that case, in agricultural soils. In this case, will be the soils below seaweed farms. So there are approaches that we can use to address this uncertainty. And the other element is then how the, how the seaweed farm is, uh, the crop is used. And uh, Rod Fujita then gave a number of examples of how different uses of the seaweed crops can be uh, can actually contribute also to mitigate climate change. So there's that dimension as well. But I believe there's an important element that we need to remind ourselves 
uh, which is that when we uh, uh, consider seaweed as a component of the food system, then if uh, seaweed products replace other farm products, then the carbon footprint of seaweed is the lowest uh, of any uh, crop in the world. So then we should also uh, consider the displacement of uh, emissions uh, from food systems when we introduce seaweed. So it's not about considering the seaweed isolated, seaweed farming an isolated component, but actually seeing seaweed as part of the of the food system. So regardless of uh, of you know whether what is the net balance of uh, emissions with seaweed farming, certainly uh, seaweed products have the lowest carbon footprint of any food item. So uh, displacing other food items by seaweed in diets go a long way into uh, reducing carbon footprints, but also uh, water footprints because seaweed uh, products are essentially free of, uh, of freshwater use. And that's really very important in a, in a world where food production is increasingly constrained by, uh, by water availability. And then I mentioned I would address, and I think I have one minute left, uh, the, the other two elements, which is pollution and biodiversity. And there's compelling evidence that seaweed farms also work as habitats that create habitat for biodiversity and increase biodiversity locally. So that we need to also consider that benefit of seaweed farming and also seaweed remove excess nutrients and process pollutants in the in the water and in, in also then reduce ocean acidification. So they also uh, contribute to uh, improve water quality and therefore uh, abate pollution. And I just want to emphasize to conclude uh, point made by earlier on, which is that we also need to uh, replace materials that are used in seaweed farming, for instance, plastics, by sustainable materials so that we do not inadvertently introduce also pollutants like plastic with seaweed farming. So again, uh, a very important solution when it's scaled to its possible potential for both climate action, uh, food system, improving the sustainability of food systems, and also improving the uh, uh, coastal ecosystems where seaweed farming is conducted. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, Carlos, for this wise word and for this explanation. Uh, we see a, a great potential here and science has to uh, make some progress and, and validate them all, but uh, pretty confident that seaweed will be recognized as blue carbon uh, officially by the UNFCCC with the carbon credit mechanism very soon. Uh, and, and your support, uh, uh, it will be very instrumental into that. Uh, so let's uh, now move to uh, the pioneers that are uh, into action, uh, developing some project. I mean, uh, Kelp Blue, Caroline from Kelp Blue, this project is quite uh, one of the most inspirational uh, one uh, happening in Namibia, but also uh, in New Zealand and some other place. It has been awarded by many prizes as a uh, one of the most uh, sustainable and uh, one of the most incredible project uh, in the world. Uh, but uh, Caroline uh, Hooftus Sludweg will, will tell us more about uh, this uh, amazing project that is uh, Kelp Blue and what they could do about biodiversity as well as climate change and pollution. Yes, perfect. I hope everyone, everyone can see my screen, I hope. And if not, uh, yeah. just say something great. So um, very pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation to be among such um, esteemed uh, guests and also I've seen and uh, the other speakers. Here's a picture of our farm in Namibia. And uh, we talk about biodiversity here, you'll see a human and our seaweed, but I will talk to you a little bit more about why seaweed is so fantastic at increasing biodiversity. But first a little bit about you know, who we are and, and what we're doing at Kelp Blue. So Kelp Blue was founded in 2020 right before COVID hit. And I think that was actually quite good because what that allowed us to do is really focus on what was really what we're trying to do. And what we do is we cultivate giant kelp forests around the world to boost biodiversity, improve ocean health and sequester CO2. That is primarily why we do that. But we are also a commercial organization, which means we have to do something with the kelp. We've heard from Carlos and um, from Rob also what um, amazing, properties kelp has and how it can replace a lot of um, environmental, environmentally damaging input materials for other industries. What we do is we cultivate the giant kelp, which is a kelp that grows up. It can be reharvested. So what we do is we harvest only that canopy. So we only cut the top of the seaweed 
And from that, we make sustainable products for the agricultural industry, also for textiles and its input material for nutraceuticals and um, pharma. What we also do is we deliver at scale. So we've seen where seaweed can grow and it's mostly in near shore environments. What Kelp Blue does is we go offshore. We can plant and cultivate forests in up to 150 meters depth. So in Namibia, this is where our first project is. We are in near shore and we are offshore. We hope to soon be operating in New Zealand and Alaska. So like I said, why is this so important for us? Well. We've already, um, Carlos has already said about how it's great at capturing carbon and also at increasing biodiversity, but from the products that we make, which is going to be a biostimulant, we also help increase um, uh, land health, so soil health. And we know now that farmers, there's a very big problem with farms that have been intensively uh, um, uh, plowed and a lot of chemical fertilizers have been used, the life has gone out of the soil. There's almost no biodiversity in the soil. And what seaweed can do is also help restore biodiversity into that soil. So we do it for ocean regeneration and land regeneration. Just um, a little bit of a, a note. Um, why is kelp so great at um, uh, restoring biodiversity in the ocean? Well, giant kelp is what's called, and seaweed in general, is what's called an, an ecosystem engineer. An ecosystem engineer is anything that has the power to build up an ecosystem or to destroy it. Um, human beings being the best at doing both. But if we look at positive impact, then it would be, um, we would say kelp has enormous uh, uh, power to be able to do that because over 800 species have been known to shelter in and around kelp forests. We also are doing it for carbon sequestration. Um, what you see is at the bottom, we have giant kelp, but there are asterisks there. The model that um, Dr. Duarte has uh, spoken about, it's something that kelp blue is actively proving. So there is still a lot of science that needs to be proven around carbon sequestration as well as biodiversity. We are trying to validate that and plug those gaps in the science. And how we're doing that is we've set up a foundation and it's called the Kelp Forest Foundation. This is where we do all of our research into the claims that we're making about biodiversity and about carbon sequestration. We do this under a foundation because it is completely open. It is completely open source and we do it together with um, a, lot of the, a lot of universities around the world. But now more about the topic about what we've been asked to um, speak about is biodiversity. So we started in an area in Namibia where there, there wasn't much there. And when I say that we are in a very silty, sandy bottom, we're near shore. Um, it has been intensively um, used. It's where um, the sea bottom has been mined and then the, the diamonds have been brought up and then all the sediment gets put out there. So effectively we are building a new ecosystem. We know that it's very effective at kelp, cultivating kelp is very effective at building that ecosystem. And how are we going about proving it? Well, what we are doing is we have an extensive um, um, marine monitoring program where we actively take a lot of um, samples from the water. We do that mainly via environmental DNA. So we do this every month. And um, what we do is we take a, a liter of water. So what you see is this um, graph here. We have four sites where we take water from. We put that water through a filter. That filter then gets sent to Nature Metrics in the UK, and they run it through a, a, a rapid a gene sequencer. So anything that's left, a trace of their DNA, whether it be a, a, a fish scale or an egg or a, a bit of uh, defecation, it all comes out. It can be seen in what the results are. So we can very quickly and very easily see the uh, amount of biodiversity that we have in um, that uh, area. And we can very easily track that over time. So it's incredibly exciting to be able to leverage technology and new, new techniques to be able to track how much biodiversity is increasing. We also use acoustics, which is passive and active bioacoustics in the water to be able to track uh, marine life. We are also working with universities to understand what kind of acoustic imprint a lot of species leave. And we are very much a, uh, I wouldn't say a playground, but we're very much a test ground of testing out new technology to be able to prove that biodiversity increase. Um, what's very interesting, and I think what I, I'd like, it's very small here, but um, what you see on the left is a result from some of our um, eDNA uh, work that we've been doing. And the top is what was the output from the very beginning when we first started. And at the bottom, you see there's a very large aqua semicircle, the, the half of it is a semicircle. And what's very interesting is 
These are the results that have come back. And this is eDNA from Deepwater Cape Hake. Now, Deepwater Cape Hake, they say it, it is in the deep water. But what we're finding, if they're in the kelp forests in um, our, our, which are relatively shallow, we think that there were actually um, the deep water Cape Hake are coming in to spawn. And this is very good news because if you look at fish eggs and how they were are, are spread out into the water, they have much more chance of survival if they're in a protected environment. So we're very excited about this um, result because if we can prove that we are also helping deplete some stocks of overfished fish, then that is very great, not only for um, uh, the oceans, but also just for other seaweed farmers uh, in future. We're conducting three very important um, researches and together with some of the partners that you see here on the slide, we are um, monitoring the impact of, uh, of the kelp forest on our biodiversity in the fauna. We're also uh, measuring the increase and the impact in biodiversity by taking an algal baseline along the coast. And what we're also doing is we're expanding the ENA database, not only on algae, but also on other fish species. Uh, and what we are doing here will benefit think a lot of um, seaweed farmers around the world, because where we recognize that there's a gap, we will take, we will try and get the, um, the fish and then we'll try to get the DNA so it can be added to that global database. Here are just a few photos of, um, um, well, the top uh, left is actually one of our, our, our favorite uh, animals that we see swimming around in our kelp forest, and that's a shy shark. And they're really, they're really quite sweet. They, they really are shy, but they, they love our cultivated kelp forest. And what they do is they wrap themselves in a ball so um, they won't get eaten. So they pretend they're bigger than they are. On the right, you see a, a seahorse that has uh, been hanging around our, our structures. We've uh, named him Buddy. Um, and the, uh, an aerial view of our, our, uh, one of our seaweed patches from above. So you can see that it just looks like an enormously rich and inviting bed of, of softness for biodiversity to take place. And on the um, bottom left, we have our uh, team of uh, MSc students that are helping conduct all of the research that we do into how we are tracking our biodiversity increase. And you've just seen me, but I've, uh, I would uh, just close off with uh, the team. This is a, a photo of the team in Namibia. And I think by far we have a, a very large team of engineers, but um, also a very, very large uh, team of marine uh, monitors that go out and uh, actively track the biodiversity increase. All of our reports are published via the Kelp Forest Foundation. If you're interested in it, if you're interested in anything else, I would gladly answer any questions in the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina, and very, very inspirational project. Indeed, a very young team, I should say. It's amazing to see the, how, how people are attracted by this project and how, uh, how the, they are enthusiastic about it and happy to work for such a great, great project. We are very proud with the Global Seaweed Coalition to have supported this project and to have partnered with you for quite a long time and to keep supporting this kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, really great project. Uh, funding is a big issue, uh, and then we'd like to move forward. As, as I say, uh, there needs to be a collaboration between all UN agencies, programs, and so forth. So Valérie Hickey here, Global Director, Environment, Natural Resources, and Blue Economy for the World Bank, uh, will tell us uh, what is the World Bank perspective on seaweed and how active they are. And I know you are doing a lot of things already and doing very great. Thank you so much, Vincent, and good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. It's lovely to be here with you, sort of with you here in Nairobi, yeah, but apart in, in, in different spaces. Um, we absolutely at the World Bank are part of the seaweed revolution, or as we call it, the she-weed revolution, because of how important seaweed is as a product for women. Um, and the reason we are is because our mission is to end poverty on a livable planet, and we're never going to have a world without poverty, we're never gonna have a world with a livable planet in a world without seaweed. And you've heard about it here today. You hear the hype. This is a, a sector, a, a, a set of species, a product that is ripe for greater production. We know it's good for development. Just next door in Tanzania, we've got 25,000 jobs alone, 70% of whom are women in the seaweed sector. We heard from Madagascar, same thing, the importance of this sector for GDP, for jobs, especially for women. We know it's important for climate change, even though I have to be honest, after listening to some of the presentations this afternoon, I'm more confused than I ever have been about why it's good for climate change, but we know it is. And we know how important it is for nature. We saw some of those wonderful pictures from Caroline. 
But it's not just because it's good for development, climate and nature. The market is extremely interested in seaweed. We've seen compound annual interest growth rates of over 10% per year. We, we've done a market analysis at the World Bank, and we think between now and 2026, the market value of seaweed will grow by $12 billion to as much as $85 billion. So that's a huge market and a market that's growing. We've already heard there's no space constraints. Less than 2,000 square kilometers used for seaweed. We've seen some reports, done, done some analysis ourselves, and believe that there's up to 48 million square kilometers that are ripe for seaweed production. And we have a wonderful authorizing environment globally, whether it's through the global biodiversity framework, whether it's through the SDGs, not just SDG 14, but SDG 2, for example, on food. So we have all of the elements of a seaweed revolution to really use seaweed as an engine of jobs, climate change and nature. But it's not really happening and it's not happening in the places we want to, particularly here in Africa. We heard earlier from the professor on Madagascar, in Tanzania alone, we've actually seen a huge drop in seaweed production from 17,000 tons of dried weight in 2015 to less than 11,000 in the last year. So why is that? Because Vincent, you said everything has to be driven by science, and I agree, but science is not enough. So I want to talk about four things that I think are going to be critical to turn this seaweed revolution into reality. The first is regulation. This is so incredibly important. At the end of the day, for science to be translated into action, regulation comes in between. And we need to have better regulation in this space because too often seaweed is regulated and lumped in with other crops or other types of seafood. And it's not necessarily right in either category. We've actually seen some regulatory changes on things as simple as import and export permit fees in Tanzania actually helping reduce the cost and in a marginal cost business like seaweed where the margins can be quite small even a small reduction in cost through better regulation can help so regulation matters including by the way for phytosanitary standards which are going to be increasingly important in the export market when we're seeing a growth in the market in nutraceuticals in the pharma industry and in food and so we need those better standards the second area where we need a lot of attention is in institutional strengthening. Who exactly manages seaweed in government? Is it the Department of Fisheries? Is it the Ministry of Agriculture? Who is doing it? Who's in charge of it? From the public sector side, we need to have a credible counterpart. But it's not just about the public sector side. We need better partners in academia. When it comes to, for example, thinking through new cultivation techniques, new hybridization methods, we need research and development done not just through the private sector, not just through the commercial sector, but in public universities. This needs to be done better. But we also need to strengthen micro, small and medium sized businesses, because this is often where seaweed is farmed and produced. It is not always at large commercial scale. Often it's small farmers, small seaweed farmers, medium sized enterprises. And these are who we need to support, particularly in the pre-competitive space. You know, a lot of times we talk to the seaweed farmers and we talk to them about seaweed farming, about the production techniques, about value chain techniques. And the truth is they need less help in that than they do in the pre-competitive business space for them to translate their existing technical knowledge into financial success. They need to build a good business, not just good seaweed production. And that means learning about financial management, learning about procurement, building a credit history. That's what we have to spend more time is building strong, small, micro, medium sized enterprises so that they can enter the market much stronger. But in addition to better regulation, stronger institutions of the public and private sector, we also need better public infrastructure, particularly digital infrastructure. In a world where we want to disintermediate value chains so farmers can connect more closely to the market, so sellers can connect to buyers without losing all of that value through intermediaries, we need digital infrastructure to help make that happen. We also, of course, need traditional old fashioned infrastructure so that seaweed that's brought in, that's dried, can actually be exported, can be sent to market, whether that market is local or overseas. And of course, we need to decarbonize that infrastructure where we can, as you heard earlier today. 
Finally, we need finance. And this is, of course, part of why the World Bank is always invited to these meetings, because at the end of the day, we are a bank. And we provide international public finance together with some of the vertical green funds, for example, the Global Environment Facility, that engages in trying to catalyze this she-weed revolution. And our money is important for a couple of things. One, it can help build that public infrastructure. It can also help de-risk for the private sector side. And this is important because we can de-risk through co-investing, through specific risk reduction, particularly by building stronger regulations. Because if anything attracts private investment into a sector, it's regulatory certainty. But we can also provide credit enhancement to businesses so that those low margins that the seaweed industry often has can still be enough to produce a profit to attract private sector investment. We also, of course, need to help with better public domestic resource mobilization. Globally, countries spend $35 billion on subsidies in the seafood sector. $22 billion of that is for perverse subsidies. If only a small fraction of that could be repurposed and instead sent to seaweed farmers, we could suddenly see them having the input investment that they needed to make a difference. But finally, and perhaps the most important piece of the finance puzzle, and it's one we don't talk enough about, are local retail banks. I was lucky enough to join the Africa Aquaculture Society meetings in Zambia in November. And what we heard from agriculture business after agriculture business, including seaweed farmers, is that they're not able to borrow on the local retail markets. And they're not able to borrow because they haven't they don't have a credit history, and that's something we have to help. Again, it's about building those strong business institutions, whether they're micro, small, medium, or large. They also can't borrow because the interest rates are simply too high. In Nigeria, 37%. The margins in seaweed are simply not good enough to be able to repay that type of interest back loan. So we need to figure out how to help retail banks price risk in this sector and become a partner in building the seaweed revolution as an engine of jobs and GDP and as a very safe investment for local retail money. So count on us at the World Bank to help with the regulation, to help build strong institutions, public private sector, really build up that public infrastructure and to provide finance and help unlock private finance. Because until and unless we do that, the hype around seaweed is forever going to remain that and it's not going to be translated into what we know can be gains for development, climate and nature. Back to you, Vincent. Thank you very much for this. Uh, and I think uh, you summarize very much uh, what we are trying to do and trying to support. And of course, uh, the, the, the World Bank is, uh, is part of our coalition. I mean, your colleague Harrison is in the, in the, in the strategic board as well. Uh, and we are trying to work on it uh, through that as well. We've seen some progress. I mean, last month in Europe, uh, as the number of seaweed, I mean, talking about revolution, uh, regulation, number of seaweed uh, suitable for food consumption has been moved from 20 to uh, 80, uh, which is a very good progress that's been fast-tracked as edible food. Um, we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, the seaweed uh, as the Algae EU Summit last October, uh, developed by the European Commission to create, uh, to support institution. So, of course, it's, it's not going fast enough, but it's, there are some progresses and we are working together on it. I think the point you made about the financial aspect is absolutely critical indeed. We need to see how we can get mobilized. And we are also working on a global seaweed fund with blended finance right now, a very ambitious project that could support. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll make it happen all together very soon. Um, this topic is about pollution as well. How can it help to address pollution? And uh, as a coalition, we've been uh, lucky enough to be nominator for the Earthshot Prize. We nominate, of course, Kelp Blue, but we also nominated some others, including the, the next one, which is a very innovative topic. Uh, and when we try to describe uh, what uh, seaweed uh, can replace and what seaweed can do, I think no one will think about this first. Uh, but this next project is, uh, is, uh, is really amazing. Uh, so I'd like Ines from Germany, Ines Schiller, CEO of Wild, to tell us what she is doing and more importantly, why she is doing that and why it's so important for uh, the next generation and for the women of the next generation. Thank you so much. Um, you can see my presentation? We can. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Ines Schiller. I'm the founder and CEO of WILD. Um, I'm honored to address you on this 
other very um, urgent matter, um, plastic pollution and the transformative solutions we are pioneering at Wild using seaweed. As you've already heard, seaweed offers immense potential in addressing biodiversity loss and climate change. Now let's explore how seaweed, I love that, uh, can revolutionize our fight against plastic pollution. At Wild, we are dedicated to creating radically sustainable, ocean-friendly and healthy absorbent products made from seaweed. Products that otherwise often end up as waste in the ocean become fully biodegradable and not only use significantly fewer resources in their production, but also support ocean health. Our mission stems from my first-hand experience as a marine guide, where I witnessed the versatility, health benefits and sustainability of marine microalgae. Our flagship product, the Calpon, is the world's first tampon made from seaweed and set to launch later this year. And that's just the beginning. We've also developed the Windle, a plastic-free, fully compostable diaper inlay with a seaweed core. These innovations mark the first steps toward what we envision as the algaeverse, a universe of healthy algae products that serve as a model for a regenerative socioeconomic system. Now, let's confront the harsh reality of plastic pollution. Since the 1950s, over 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic have been produced worldwide. The vast majority of it still exists in some form today, with approximately 50% being initially produced for single use. Every year, an estimated 10 million metric tons of plastic waste enter our oceans. This is the equivalent to dumping one garbage truck full of plastic into the ocean every minute. And this rampant pollution inflicts approximately $13 billion a year in environmental damage to marine ecosystems. You probably know all of this. <laughs> what you might not know is how conventional absorbent products such as tampons and diapers add to this crisis. Up to 80% of the materials used in the global non-woven production are synthetic, with over 50% being actually plastics. Sanitary products rank among the top 10 of most common types of waste washing up on beaches, comprising 10% of total marine litter. And even though there are a number of products that advertise sustainability, if you take a closer look at their production, they cannot keep their green promises, let alone a circular approach. The current production chain is just not future fit. And here's the critical point. This is not the menstruators or baby's fault. There's often environmental shaming directed at those who use these products, but the real issues lie within the industry that continues to rely on plastics. That's where seaweed steps in as a unique opportunity for change and out designing waste. Our seaweed products offer a sustainable alternative combining product performance with true environmental stewardship. As you know, seaweed is naturally absorbent. It has anti-inflammatory properties, a very low potential to cause allergies or irritations and is microbiome friendly. Additionally, it has a history of safe use in food and medicine and can be processed on standard industry machinery without major changes. The feedback we received from testers so far has been overwhelmingly positive, reinforcing our belief in the immense potential of seaweed for regenerative products. The global abundance of seaweed and the diversity offers a solid base for us to use it as a sustainable raw material in a circular economy. Together, we must seize this opportunity to harness the power of seaweed as a force for positive change in our fight against plastic pollution. Thank you a lot for your attention and commitment to this vital cause. Let's embark on this journey toward a cleaner, healthier planet, one seaweed product at a time. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ines, and uh, so important your message. And uh, we would like to remember, to remind everyone as well that uh, cotton is, uh, is not either a sustainable product. It represents two percent of the cultured land, and twenty-five percent of the pesticide use, and ten percent of the herbicide. So, I mean, there's not only uh, plastic that we need to kill. Uh, there's a lot of other problems that we need to address, and and your solution is contributing to that. So, thanks a lot for your innovation. Uh, so what is, uh, what is the position of seaweed uh, in the ink uh, negotiation right now, the plastic pollution negotiation? Uh, so we will have David uh, José uh, Vivas Egui, uh, legal officer at the, at the UNCTAD, uh, to tell us a word about uh, where we are and how uh, trade environment and gender dimension can support uh, on that. 
Thank you very much for the invite, and uh, it's going to be easy to speak after these wonderful presentations. Uh, uh, the first element is that, I guess, can you listen to me? Can you listen to me? Hello? Can you listen to me? Okay. Yes, so we uh, wonders of technology. Talking about technology, perhaps when we talk about seaweed, we are uh, in front of a very green uh, emerging sector uh, with low environmental impacts, with low carbon footprint, or sometimes positive, depending on the case, and a huge trade potential, innovation potential, diversification potential, emerging new activities, et cetera. So, so, so there are very few sectors today that we can say this. You know, and that's why we, we need to somehow start a betting on this one. Now, uh, seaweed has become increasingly fashionable as uh, consumer uh, patterns change, especially towards plant-based and biomass-based materials, not only for food, but for many other uh, purposes. And now we are seeing a huge growth in what we can call the seaweed market. The issue is that three, four years ago, there was not that conscious of the seaweed sector as a sector. So I'm gonna show two, not the slides, but two databases that we're using on that to show that growth so we can more or less perceive this in more economic terms. I'm gonna share a screen, allow me please. Uh, and you tell me if you can see it. The first one I want to show here is uh, this one, let me move it here, the seaweed farming boom. And we are starting to monitor the sector and all ocean space sectors. I will show two databases. This is the first one. Then the first one is we could see that in 2000, we have only $5 billion in, 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 in value, market value of seaweed and 11, uh, sorry, $11 billion in, in seaweed and $5 billion, sorry, $5 billion in, in value and $11 billion in metric tons. This has go to 35 in 2000 and 70 billion market sites in 2000. I will update this to 2021. But this is not the end of the story. This is just one angle of the market. The other one that I can offer is the trade angle. And I will go to that one. Sorry, here you have it. This is the ONTAC Oceans Trade Database. And we have different uh, databases, but we have one on Oceans Trade. And if you see here in aquatic, in other living marine species and organisms in trade, we can follow the track of trade to today, which is about $1.2 billion in exports. Here you can see it. We can go to the, to the specific level. Here you can see aquatic plant seaweeds and other algae. And we can track it to 2021, $1.2 billion in exports. So we can go to this level of analysis and we keep doing it. What is important here, I'm going to stop sharing now, is that this is a market that is triple, tripling its size each 10 years. And at the same time, we know that has many environmental and consumer benefits. So again, uh, it, it, it is an area that we cannot overlook anymore, especially from the point of view of policy. In trade terms, it represents today only 14%, which means that 76% of the market is internal market, is consumed by their own producers, which is very interesting. It's a strong domestic market, especially in Asia, developing in Africa and in Latin America, and it's coming very fast also in Europe and the United States. Now, this means that we have a sunrise industry in cultivation, but we have a sunrise set of industries in innovation. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we face some challenges. Some challenges have already been mentioned. Uh, in terms of production, one challenge that we have is a lot of this activity has been in the past focusing on the artisanal side of the equation and the industrialization and mass production of seaweed is starting. And depending on the use, again, you can have a kelp forest, but that's an ecosystem service where you're producing there, or you may be cultivating seaweed for food, plastic substitutes, uh, cosmetics, etc., medicines, etc. Now, uh, the thing is that we have not done enough analysis yet for a big transition to industrial cultivation of seaweed worldwide. We don't know yet the effects of monoculture, if this will lead to monoculture, different species, and what effects they will be on the ecosystem while well, this will be deployed. We have some initial production, some initial analysis. We need to understand this better to also understand impacts such as 
Uh, we may benefit certain fish species over others. We may uh, absorb carbon, but at the same time, in certain areas, we may absorb more oxygen than necessary. So we need to just be careful towards the future, uh, even with all these benefits, to be 100% sure of any impact, especially in the scale of, of the activity. Now we have another uh, two considerations on the producers. We have heard the issue of uh, uh, competition over the space, ocean space, and the need for a spatial plant. The issue of having culture ex situ and in situ. And if you do ex situ, you have multi-trophic aquaculture. If you do in situ, you need to set your own standards and measures. And now this leads me to one big gap. Uh, there are almost no international recognized standards and regulations of seaweed for multiple purposes. If you see the guidelines of the Codex Alimentarium, so fisheries and other seafood products, seaweed is not there. It doesn't exist. There are propos proposals to include that in the Codex Alimentarium and develop the guidelines that they do not exist. And again, there are different type of human uses. You may use it for food, but also for cosmetic. It has a topic impact on, on humans and also on fertilizers or animal fat, depending on what you want to do. And only we have found Two general standards. One is the onto value trade, blue value trade uh, uh, principles and criteria that's applied to value chain, and the ASC standard on seaweed. So there are very few, even ESO, there is only certain things, very, very limited. So that's a big gap if you want to scale up globally. So we need to develop those standards and start to discuss it about them. Now, in terms of the social impact of gender, I was very happy to see the previous product. I think. Uh, it's, it's a very innovative and, and, and I love the, all the impacts. I think it's important to know that 40% of all the startups in seaweed are led by women. It's incredible. I'm not talking about the women cultivating. This is great also, you know, but the 40% the of the innovation is driven by women. In cultivation, a lot of women are involved. And this is interesting because it comes many times as a complementary activity, meaning Men are going to fish, do tourism, do port activity, cargo, etc. And women start to engage in this activity as a women-driven activity to complement family income in many countries. And I think this is important to keep a balance and ensure uh, the sustainability of families and incomes uh, 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 at the local level. Now, on 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 um, on the use of uh, seaweed to do plast non -pl what is called non plastic non plastic substitutes. There is an article in the INC draft, the new draft. It has been there already since the beginning on non-plastic substitute. I think for the entire seaweed sector, it's gonna be a very important article to insert and start looking at what will be the future for seaweed as a non-plastic substitute. Uh, we have done the analysis. There are more than 400 a, a billion dollars in non-plastic substitutes, not only on seaweed, there are many other products like sea, like natural fibers or agricultural waste, but we're going to do a specific research and I would like to invite all involved for interviews on marine-based non-plastic substitutes. We can map the entire sector and have it. Finally, I think we need a roadmap. I think people started to mention some of the elements. Most of them, I uh, agree 100%. I think we need to add some more. The number one, again, is that it's still a very invisible sector. The only areas where you have national uh, authorities dealing with the matter are usually aquaculture authorities. That could be linked to fisheries, that could be sometimes not be in the Ministry of Agriculture, they're sometimes in the Ministry of Production. So this, this is very interesting because they are not yet mapped. Second, uh, there are, the seaweed sector is not included in national development policies. In very few cases on biodiversity national action plans and almost zero in climate mitigation. You know, they're starting to have the blue carbon and this initiative, but they are not really realized at the national level. I think we need to expand the research and development that we have not only in carbon sequestration, but there are many biosecurity, biosafety risk linked to bacteria, linked to heavy metals, linked to persistent organic pollutants, and the, when they are absorbed by seaweed, because the, the, the seas are also being polluted. So we need to be very really careful on how we do that. And those standards, again, do not exist globally. I think we need to advocate for harmonization and discussion of what standards we need at different levels, food, non-food, and within non-food, fertilizers, cosmetics, uh, plastic substitutes, etc. Finally, we need to promote training, venture, access to credits, to finance, to the small producers. We need to not only defend the emergence of a big industry, but also ensure that the small can benefit from this uh, new sector. And finally, we need to invest in the research and development of these new products, because again, the main problem of the seaweed sector, if you saw the statistics I had at the beginning, is that it's tend to be a low value 
high volume cell, meaning a lot of tons of biomass, but the value is low in the market, especially if you compare it to fisheries. You know, it's 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 a very low kilogram ratio. So the only way to move upwards in the value chain is to add value and not just sell the dry, the wet, or the very specific uh, basic raw materials in the process and engage everybody in this production from the forest to the consumer. Thank you very much. Sorry if I was long. I have I will put on the chat all the statistics because I think they may have fun playing with the different scenarios. And thank you for inviting. It's on is always an ally, and we will have a meeting presenting these ideas at the Seven Biotrade Congress in Ontag in one month, and also at the Ocean Forum in preparation for the NIST nice UN Oceans Conference. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, we really appreciate your support as well at Youngtad. And our dear Nicola Dyer will uh, will be at your uh, summit uh, next month to represent our coalition. So we are very happy to uh, to 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 to, uh, to see that you keep supporting this this great topic. I think we are all very glad in this coalition talking uh, to support such a great great topic and uh, uh, so much pioneers that are taking risk and that are very brave pioneers trying to support that solution in real. In reality, and uh, I think that uh, that's what keeps us awake uh, every day, and uh, and it's that that was is really really cool to be in this uh, in this uh, in this coalition and in this sector. I think we all agree uh, there's a lot of hope and optimism around that. Uh, I think we should stop feeding the next generation with uh, fears and drama and try to work on solutions. That's our duty. Uh, just a word before I leave the floor to our best uh, sponsor uh, uh, since the beginning of this journey. Uh, just a word to say that nothing grows in isolation and uh, seaweed is surrounded by microbial and non-microbial organisms um, that we need to uh, consider as well, which is why we have just started the design of a plankton manifesto that will be released uh, in a few months, uh, trying to um, raise awareness on what represents over 90% of the biomass uh, in the open ocean uh, and maybe the greatest source of uh, climate change and mitigation in the world today uh, and one of the most important and most ignored uh, aspects of the ocean. So plankton manifesto, there's a lot of, uh, there's already some, uh, it's just starting, but there's already some uh, social media uh, accounts available so you can check where, where, where we are with that. So stay tuned, there will be some news in that direction as well in the upcoming months. But um, yeah, I won't, I won't sum up what has been said, but I would like to leave the floor to one of our best supporters since the very beginning of this initiative. Uh, this the, the one who had this visionary uh, <laughs> dream to let us, uh, to let us uh, do what we are doing right now and let us create this civil manifesto and this civil coalition and support that. I mean, from the very beginning, she was, uh, she voices voiced uh, seaweed uh, and she spread the seaweed gospel at the UN uh, food, set, food system summit back a few years ago. Sanda, thank you very much for everything you did and the floor is yours to give a, a few uh, closing remarks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vincent uh, and Sophia, really, for uh, putting together this session and really bringing together a stellar group of, of speakers. I mean, I think it's been a very insightful learning session, quite frankly. Um, so to all of you who've joined us, it's a real sincere pleasure to be here today. Those in Nairobi, unseasonably hot. I mean, I'm Kenyan, but really, this is this is something else, which really focuses us on the need for really finding solutions for so many things and the challenges that we face right now. Whatever you can hear yeah. a bit of background noise. Good. I think we're we're good now. Yeah. So I I'd like to just say I really thank uh, the governments that have joined us, Madagascar, and Indonesia. Uh, Yuna Platicia, thank you so much for setting the scene and really highlighting the importance of Yunea. And you know, to the colleagues who are part of the Global Compact Seaweed Coalition, really important work as we continue to innovate and to learn. Let me say on a light note, there's very few places in the world today where you can comfortably say the phrase, we need a revolution and not have it elicit uh, fear and, and, and other emotions. So it's great to see the optimism that surrounds the discussions that we have had today. Um, new and innovative solutions are much needed. And I think the discussions we've had about the untapped potential of seaweed have been truly insightful. The potential of jobs from an inclusivity perspective, the potentials of revenues, the potential of sustainable food, restoration of biodiversity, and of course, for ultimately climate action, absolutely important. It's a really important time, I think, as, as we will convene further in UNEA to really reflect on the triple planetary crisis, climate change, 
nature and biodiversity loss as well as pollution. But there's some great figures that should inspire. And it's not to say that the monetary figures are those that drive most, but oftentimes are the ones that gain the most understanding. So we're aiming by 2030 to have investments of at least 72 billion to protect and restore just 30% of our oceans. And seaweed ecosystems are absolutely essential within, within this. And we've heard a lot about that from the experts today. The forests of the seas, as we call them, often unseed and undervalued, and we've gotten a glimpse of them in this session, truly hold immense potential to address our global goals. We've heard about how seaweed supports the bi marine biodiversity, providing food and habitat, absorbing pollutants in many ways. And it's not just really an environmental uh, imperative, but really great socioeconomic opportunities. But what do we need to do better and what do we need to do more of as we advance this revolution? And great to hear from governments, uh, from the innovators and from the World Bank, because we truly must continue with this multifaceted, multi-stakeholder approach. So much more need for collaboration across sectors and borders, which is always a challenge given today's um, you know, uh, deficits of trust and, and challenges around a truly multilateral system. But truly proud to say that this UN Global Compact and the Seaweed Coalition is really a first global platform for seaweed stakeholders across the full value chain. You know, from the World Bank, we heard about the need for strength and regulation. And I fully agree that this is important if we're going to protect and regulate the seaweed habitat. You know, lots of exciting other players that we need to continue to collaborate with the International Maritime Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and the International Labor Organization, ILO. And of course, the international community, wherever, you know, our work spans must truly collaborate on seaweed research, and we've heard a lot about that today. Data gathering will continue to be very important so that we can really reap and understand the full economic value, the full environmental benefits and the social opportunities so that we can have better decision-making and encourage investment in the field. We've also heard about the, these micro and small and medium enterprises that drive the seaweed economy. Supporting these small seaweed farmers and, and, and entrepreneurs is absolutely crucial. We know the challenge around access to capital, scale, and scope, but also the importance of having equal access to sustainable practices and practical guidelines. Inclusivity is absolutely key for what we need to do. So as we leave this assembly, and thank you all for your contributions and your insights, I, I just want to say, you know, reaffirming our commitment to strategies to explore, to protect, and to promote this vital resource is absolutely essential because together I think we can definitely translate all that we've heard about in terms of potential into something that can grow in scale and scope and really drive forward sustaining a nature-based industry with enormous benefits for both people and planet. So thank you all for your support for the coalition. Thank you colleagues who drive this, Sophia Van Sant and, and the rest of you. I think it's been an incredibly insightful session. I'll hand back over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I think uh, we had a uh, we had a great session here. Once again, nothing more to say. Thank you a lot, and the 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 work is continuing right now. So it can only be all together. So see you and speak to you very soon. Bye.